Zuko is the founder of Least Authority and Zcash. He's also the C CEO of Zcash. He's a longtime advocate and creator of privacy enhancing technologies. We're really happy to have him here. He's going to talk about why privacy matters. Hello, thank you all for being here. I'm totally nervous. Um, Liz asked me to talk about why privacy matters, and that seems like a really daunting topic. Um, but I think I figured it out, because I figured out that uh, the question is why it matters to other people, not to me. But let me start by uh, saying that it, it's, um, it's, it's always special for me to visit Berlin, because uh, I'm reminded of the Berlin Wall, which suddenly fell when I was 15 years old, and that was really surprising to me at the time. And I later read histories about it and found out that it was really surprising to everyone else at the time, too. Uh, and this fall was the 28th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, which was also, uh, it was 28 years old when it disappeared. So it's the, the end of the end of an era or something. And um, when I was 15 and I found out about that and other uh, unexpected changes, it seemed like a surge of peoples toward freedom and prosperity. And nowadays, I have the feeling that that surge has stalled and in many parts of our world is rolling backward. And to me, uh, privacy was an integral part of both of those movements, forward and backward. So I'll tell you briefly why privacy matters to me, and then I'll try to explore why I think it matters to other people. In my mind, what is even privacy? In my mind, it's just decentralization of control over the dissemination of information. And that makes it intimately tied to freedom of speech. You can't, you can't have privacy without enabling freedom of speech, and you can't have pervasive lack of privacy without disabling freedom of speech. And over the last 15 years or so, we've seen this unprecedented dramatic evolution in which the internet sprouted sensors. It sprouted eyeballs by the tens of millions or hundreds of millions. I don't know how many eyeballs the internet has now. There are eyeballs everywhere, and motion sensors, and temperature sensors, and uh, listening ears. And I think what's going to happen in the next few years, maybe 10 years, is that the internet is going to sprout um, effectors, fingers and fists that can do things, because all of the door locks, and cars, and stop lights, and cash registers, and everything else is going to be responding to the internet's decisions, whims. So I think it's a really important moment. Um, <laughs> so uh, one year ago, uh, I saw a speech in which, uh, a speech that Moxie Marlinspike made when he was accepting the Max Levchin Award for Cryptography. And in it, he characterized the cypherpunk uh, program of which I was a part. And I think he, he nailed it. He got me pretty well. He said, the whole idea was, first, we'll make things tools that are really good for us. And then second, we'll make everyone else be like us. And I thought, oh, yeah, that was what I was doing back then, yeah. Um, and I was thinking recently, there's a similar error you might make with politics. Politics is, for most people, is all about getting everyone else to value what you value, right? But uh, when I started Zcash, I immediately thought, for, um, for a globally distributed network to be most successful, it has to span not only continents and nations and networks and things like that, but it also has to span politics. You have to get people who have differing and opposing beliefs to also want it. So I've been thinking about that, and I heard this great uh, uh, lecture by um, a scholar named Arnold Kling, 
who said he'd figured out, he'd, he'd been observing, he'd been listening, and he'd uh, written down the three languages of three different opposing political groups. And uh, Arnold Kling hastens to say, this isn't explaining why they think what they think, but these are the terminologies that they use when talking to each other. And the three groups he was um, uh, analyzing were what he called libertarians, progressives, and conservatives. And he said for each of these three groups, they have a, an axis of good versus evil, of what they support and approve of and what they oppose. Uh, but these axes are not really opposite each other. They're orthogonal to each other. And they each have different terminology for what they mean by good on their axis and evil on their axis. So for libertarians, good is, free, is freedom and evil is coercion. And they interpret everything else uh, off of that axis as being a secondary consequence of, the, their, of their primary concern. So when I was listening to this lecture, I thought, oh wow, he totally nailed me. That's exactly what I think. Isn't everything else just a secondary consequence of freedom? So then he got to the next one, which is progressives, and he said, for progressives, good is oppressed groups and evil is oppressor groups. Good is supporting uh, the vulnerable and evil is supporting their oppressors. And I thought, oh, yeah, that's actually a thing. That's not just a secondary consequence of freedom versus coercion. And freedom versus, and coer freedom versus coercion isn't just a secondary consequence of that. And then he uh, got to conservatives, and he said, for conservatives, good is civilization, and evil is barbarism. And this was where this got to be a really interesting mind-expanding experience for me, as I thought, that's actually a thing, too. Civilization really is a fragile and precious jewel that I value and rely on for protecting my children and allowing me to do everything that I value in life. And it's not just a secondary consequence of freedom versus coercion or oppressed groups versus oppressor groups. So thanks to Arnold Kling, I now have a three-dimensional mind. But um, so I've been thinking about that because if you want, because privacy is a social good, not an individual good. If you make a, as we know in the, in the privacy technology science world, if you make a privacy network and there's only one user of it, then they don't get any privacy, right? Um, so, I've been thinking about how to talk about privacy to these other groups and to those libertarians, I can obviously say privacy is freedom. And the, the opposite of privacy is making yourself vulnerable to coercion. And to those progressives, I can say privacy is the opportunity to communicate and organize and share. And privacy is what shields weaker groups from more powerful groups. But also to conservatives, I can say privacy is an essential part of every successful, stable society so far. It's a, it empowers and enriches and protects societies. And that's one thing I've, uh, I was very pleasantly surprised to find out when we started the Zcash project is that privacy is highly in demand by businesses. And so to conservatives, who I think are an important faction to appeal to, we can say it's a very novel and dangerous experiment to re-architect your entire society to be predicated on the pervasive lack of privacy. And all of the successful traditions and the long-lasting societies haven't had that. And, uh, I mean, haven't had pervasive lack of privacy. They've had pervasive privacy. Um, and the ones that have had pervasive lack of privacy, like uh, the East German regime before the fall of the wall, uh, were unstable and short-lived. 
So um, when reading about that, uh, that series of events in 1989, um, the historian that I was reading emphasized that there was only one moment of about a year and a half during which that completely unexpected thing that no historian and no economist and no politician considered possible. There was only one moment when that could have happened. It couldn't have happened a year earlier. Um, the East German security services considered the option that they called the Chinese solution, referring to the bloody suppression of uh, demonstrations in Tiananmen Square that summer. And it couldn't have happened a year and a half later during the backlash in the Soviet Union. So it only could have happened then, and, and no one in power and no one who was an expert thought it was possible. But it turned out to be possible just because a whole bunch of people who didn't know any better <laughs> made it happen. And so that's the lesson I draw is when we see an opportunity, we have to take it right then. And I think 2018 is going to be a good year. I feel good about it. I think there's opportunity. And I'm very grateful to all of you for being here at the start of it. Thanks.